Exploitation Section Exhibitor's Trade Review May 13, 1922 Although hand-painted panels may not be within the reach of every theater, where they are available, they enhance the display value about 100%, as you will agree, when you take a close look at these painted by house artist Bennett of the Rialto, Omaha, Nebraska, for First Nationals' Hail the Woman. By getting sign painters to bid against each other for the construction of this special front for Fox's Thunderclap, the manager of the Washington, Dallas, Texas, secured it for only $25. It can easily be seen that it carried the atmosphere of the racetrack, which was tempered by a sign in the center, Mary Carr is the mother in Thunderclap. Tying up Paramount's Saturday night with a window display of refrigerators was a good move made by The Strand, White Plains, New York. Refrigerators offer numerous opportunities for tying up Saturday night with different articles of food that can be worked into very catchy little ads, the kind that are red. This float was driven around the streets of San Francisco six hours daily during the run of Paramount's Mistress of the World at the Rialto. The canopy was of bright yellow, the whole float decorated in gay colors, and a local dancer sat in the throne chair. The two soldiers distributed booklets that told all about the feature. Manager Samuelson of The Park, Newton, New Jersey, put this kid out as a ballyhoo for Warner Brothers' school days. While the photo does not show them, he claims to have as many freckles as Wesley Berry. This is not a still from United Artists' Little Lord Fauntleroy, but is a window in Chillicothe, Missouri that was arranged by manager Creamer of The Strand. The figures are cutouts from a poster mounted on cardboard, and lighted so artistically that they have every appearance of being real in the illustration. Two more of Creamer's well-arranged windows for United Artists' Little Lord Fauntleroy. The one on the left in a shoe store was built of cardboard, with a figure cut from a poster mounted in the window of the display. On the right, a framed three-sheet made up the display. Everyone in Chillicothe, Missouri knew this feature was playing at the Strand. You who have not forgotten the good old school days when a horse-drawn fire engine raced to the fire would have been thrilled when this old-timer raced up and down the streets of Pickway, Ohio, ballyhooing First Nationals Go and Get It at May's Opera House. It was a good stunt. Into the thoroughfares of Winnipeg, Canada was sent a man garbed in the dress of a western cowboy mounted on a horse, whose head and body was covered with canvas, which told the surprised citizens of Winnipeg that Fox's The Night Horseman was playing at the National. It made an effective street ballyhoo, as a cowboy of this nature was an unusual sight. This cutout from a 24 sheet in an oval wooden frame surrounded by stills from First Nationals' My Boy was worth a dozen ballyhoos, as it stopped pedestrians right in front of the box office of the Trianon, Birmingham, Alabama. Jackie's smile did the rest. A pretty girl riding in an old-fashioned bridal coach lined with buds and streamers and drawn by cream white horses that were driven by a high-hatted coachman created quite a sensation when it appeared in the business section in Syracuse, New York as a ballyhoo for First Nationals Smile and Through, then playing at the Strand. Ladies, as a rule, do not enjoy boxing pictures. So manager Guy Kenimer of the Arcade, Jacksonville, Florida, did not play up the fistic angle of Paramount's The World's Champion, but did turn his lobby into a gymnasium, something that the ladies are as much interested in as the men. On each side of the entrance, below the three-sided sign, The Empire, Syracuse, New York, placed two overlapping star-shaped panels, one at each entrance, displaying some poignant moment from First Nationals' Hail the Woman. The rest of the display was based on chained womanhood throwing aside the shackles. This ballyhooer might not have been a real Scotchman, but Harry Finter, manager of the Newark, Newark, New Jersey, says that he was a real comedian when he was working the streets of Newark as a walking advertisement for Paramount's Beside the Bonnie Briar Bush, as he had a crowd with him continuously, and his good-natured kidding of the public brought a lot of advertising. One of the windows in Los Angeles the kinema succeeded in breaking into with stills of First Nationals' Polly of the Follies. There were plenty of others besides this one. 
This display, arranged by manager Heil of the Ansonia, Butte, Montana, for Fox's Queen of Sheba, is unique in many respects, and attracted a great deal of attention. In a lobby that does not well lend itself to a display, manager Walter McDaniels of Nixon's Palace, Milford, Delaware, arranged an exceedingly artistic front for associated exhibitors, the writer of the King Log, that was very effective and at the same time inexpensive. It is hardly probable that a more appropriate front could be built for First Nationals, the Rosary, than this one arranged by the Empire, Syracuse, New York, which typifies an old stone church. It is not expensive either, and can be used in even the smallest lobby. Views of the lobby of the Capitol, Hartford, Connecticut, showing how manager Clancy placed the booths when he turned it into an Arabian bazaar for Vitagraph's The Sheik's Wife, and the elaborate costumes worn by the Arabs. In this booth, manager Clancy placed a veiled wax figure to impersonate the wife in Vitagraph's The Sheik's Wife. One of the booths built in the lobby of the Capitol, Hartford, Connecticut, by manager Clancy for Vitagraph's The Sheik's Wife. Featuring Coney Island in his lobby display for Paramount's Saturday Night, manager Hart of the Palace, El Paso, Texas, put over a good one for this picture.